2017, you want to sort of start putting some uh, answers in. I want to talk to the 28% who have gone full DevOps, which is cool. Exactly. Yeah. So somebody got the Tropic Thunder reference. Yes. Are all the devs in the room feeling outnumbered now? Excellent. You can keep talking amongst yourself for the next three minutes, okay. You don't have to be super quiet. experimenting with Kathy than what I thought. I mean, at, 30, at nearly 40 responses, that's 10 people who are doing stack. So that's good. There's still some seats up the front here, guys. Don't be afraid. Up here, right at the front. Couple over here, if I move my bag. Dev is making a comeback, though no, Ops is edging ahead. Sam, there, here we go. Let's get the last couple of people in. All right, guys, we're going to get uh, started because I really don't want to uh, don't want to be behind schedule before we actually get started. So uh, first of all, welcome everybody to WinOps 2017. Uh, my name's Steve Thayer, I'm one of the co-organizers uh, and co-founder of DevOps Guys. Um, this is actually our third uh, WinOps conference, um, second time we've been here um, uh, at CodeNode. Um, you know, bigger this year, we actually had a workshop track this year, yesterday, as well as the conference. We've got four tracks for you today. All of you should have your wonderful little agenda that's got all the details, and we'll run through a little bit of that now. So first of all, important stuff, the Wi-Fi details, if you haven't already connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, this was at 8 o'clock yesterday before the workshops. 
I strongly suggest that, that you're not going to get that bandwidth now, but um, we will, uh, we'll wait and see how you go. So if anybody, there's um, posters for this up everywhere throughout the, uh, throughout the building. So if you need connections to the Wi-Fi, um, otherwise 4G might be quicker if you're not on Vodafone. Um, so um, uh, sponsors, um, you know, as usual, uh, you know, it literally won't happen without the sponsors. You know, ticket sales don't even cover the hire of the venue. You know, so we really need the sponsors to, uh, to, to cover all the fantastic AV. We've got somebody over here. Um, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Yeah. Josie is live sketching some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the talks. So they're going to be sort of uh, as graphics coming up later on. Um, uh, <laughs> apparently, we have an algorithmic live coding DJ tonight for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the drinks. I don't know what an algorithmic live coding DJ is, but I'm geeky enough that I'm more interested in the IDE that he's using than the tunes he's banging out. So, okay. But uh, yes, thanks to all of our sponsors. Um, you know, really fa fantastic. There's some fantastic workshops yesterday. They're all downstairs. Go and talk to them. Um, we've got some, some zones. We can do some demos and things like that if we want to as well. So, you know, really uh, just get out there and, and have a talk about what they're doing for, uh, to enable DevOps on Windows. So uh, we've got the agenda. We've got some keynotes up here in the in the morning. So there's basically two keynotes: a quick coffee break, recharge. Then we're going to have another keynote in here. Then we're going to break out into tracks prior to lunch. It's purely for logistical reasons. That way, you're all in different rooms prior to lunch, and you all appear at the lunch queue at different times. So uh, that's the plan. I know that the stairs are going to be a bottleneck, so I would ask you make sure you know which room you want to go to and get there as quickly as possible. Really try and keep it short and sharp um, uh, in between the tracks. Uh, feedback from last year was, um, you know, there was, uh, there was too much Microsoft content, yet the highest rated speakers were the Microsoft speakers. So you guys are sort of a bit uh, schizophrenic about that. But this year, there's a Microsoft track. You want to hear some fantastic uh, stories direct from Microsoft, not only about their, their technology, but actually about their own DevOps transformation. Some of, we're going to hear some of that about from Sam as well, and um, from Ken about how they're doing DevOps and cloud services. So there's some good stories in here. People wanted some deep dive tech stuff, so that's in the tech track. People wanted to know what other people were doing. Uh, that's in the case studies track. And then people said, we're struggling like hell trying to incorporate DevOps uh, sorry, trying to incorporate data and databases into our DevOps pipeline. So we've got a dedicated data track. So, you know, heaps of great content. Um, so it's basically, you know, two, two talks break, two talks lunch, two talks break. And then the drinks event sponsored in the afternoon, New Relic. Uh, one little change to the agenda um, uh, due to... Um, so Flynn's down here. Uh, due to um, uh, a flight difficulties, Flynn needs to leave early. So we've basically just swapped these two talks. So Matt Parker's talk is going to Flynn's slot. Flynn's doing the uh, uh, 60 microservices in six months talk at the 12.30 slot. Um, any rumors he was flying Ryanair completely? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, logistics. Um, so all the rooms, if you've seen your actual thing, they're actually color-coded. The little map on the back of your thing is actually color-coded to the track number. So your, um, all the tech tracks downstairs are in command and in alt-tab. You guys are obviously up here in control at the moment. This is the biggest room. Um, uh, data track is in tab. Case study track is in alt. Uh, tech track is in command. Um, if we have to move them around due to numbers, we'll do that, but we'll probably try not to. Uh, toilets, for those of you who don't realize, there's actually toilets on this floor immediately to your, you know, my right, your left. Um, there's a set of toilets there and then there's toilets in the middle downstairs. There's lots of emergency exits, should we have a fire alarm? For those people who were here for the workshops yesterday when, when a panicked voice came over the micro a microphone telling us to get out, get out now, um, the, you, that was a unique experience. Um, uh, when somebody thought there was a bomb on the pavement outside. Um, I've literally never heard somebody so panicked in their life. Uh, but that was good. So we, I think code of conduct, you know, please, TLDR, don't be a jerk. You know, just be good to people. Um, if anybody has any issues, come and see anybody who's wearing a WinOps t-shirt or talk to one of the code node staff. Come and find me and I'll sort it out. Believe me, I will sort it out. Live polling is going to be going on throughout the day. 
cast your votes. We'll be asking various questions in the sessions and stuff, so just keep an eye on the poll, keep an eye on Twitter. Um, uh, Twitter handle for the event, uh, the hashtag is obviously just hash WinOps, um, and you know, tag DevOps guys or tag WinOps London or whatever, and we'll retweet your stuff. Um, we'll be monitoring that all week. Uh, sorry, all, all day. And that's it from me. With no further ado, I'm going to hand over to our keynote speaker. Um, so those of you who haven't met Jeffrey, <laughs> clearly have never watched MSDN Channel 9. Um, <laughs> those of you who don't have clearly never used PowerShell, so you're in, you're in, you, you, you've got some career choices to make. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, technical fellow at Microsoft, uh, Azure Stack lead architect, gave a great presentation last year on the DevOps DevOpsification of Windows Server, which was the highest rated track back this year to talk about the hybrid cloud story. Um, the hybrid cloud market is definitely uh, hotting up hugely. Um, some big moves from Amazon and Google trying to match what's happening with the Azure stack. So really interesting to see what's happening. So thank you. Over to Jeffrey. Hi. Uh, it's great be to be back in London. Have we got a microphone? There we go. Great. It's great to be back in London at WinOps. This is one of my favorite uh, conferences. Um, I want to start off with the idea that change is hard, right? Change is hard. And change requires courage. And as I've looked at the times where change was required, and sometimes I've had the courage and, and stood up and done that change, and sometimes I haven't had the courage. And when I thought about what what when I had courage versus didn't, it was when I was confident that I was standing on you know, solid principles. Uh, and so what I wanted to do today was to give you some thoughts and some principles around DevOps. You know, I've been doing a lot of deep thinking about this and come to some, uh, some conclusions. Now with that, uh, this was the talk I was going to give you. As I mentioned, change is hard, but when you, have the, when you know what's right, you have the courage to make change, I'm not going to give that talk. Instead, I'm going to give this talk. And that is talking about digital transformation, right? Now, how many people have heard of digital transformation? OK, well, some of you guys aren't paying attention. How many of you understand what digital transformation is? Right, fewer hands. Few. OK, great. So I'm going to talk about digital transformation. I think this is one of the most powerful, most powerful conversations we have going on in the marketplace, and talk about what it is and why it's important, and then how uh, this is achieved via DevOps, Azure, and Azure Stack. Okay, so last year I was here uh, talking to you about the DevOpsification of Windows Server. Do a quick recap. Uh, DevOps, as you know, is all about culture and processes, uh, and it is not about devs and tools. Uh, however, as I pointed out last year, uh, this was wrong. Okay, uh, in fact, tools and technology play a critical role in making this possible. So. Tools and technologies can make DevOps easy or can make it hard. And what I talked about how was that Windows Server 2016, we really stepped back and we architected it to make DevOps easy. So here I am a year later, a little bit humbler. Uh, of course, DevOps is hard. We made it easier. So today what I want to talk to you about is how DevOps is about aligning people and processes and that how cloud platforms, and here I mean cloud platforms in general, uh, help enable and accelerate DevOps. And then of course Azure, Azure is one of the cloud platforms and it is an awesome cloud. And that Azure Stack, the way to think about Azure Stack, now here let me give you some background. A lot of people think they know what Azure Stack is and they don't, right? They're projecting their hopes and dreams and ambitions into it. So one of my goals is to be clear about what Azure Stack is and what it is not. Azure Stack extends Azure, so it is Azure, but it extends it to more customers and more scenarios. And we'll be clear about that. And then the, the bottom line for this talk is that DevOps, Azure, and Azure Stack align and accelerate people, processes, and platforms to deliver digital transformation. That's it. Like if you Walk away with nothing, this is the thing you want to do. In fact, I could end right now. That's the story, okay? So let's talk about this, right? We know about the last 20 years, right? Last 20 years has been pretty clear. We had developers. They focused in on developing code, testing code, right? They would get business requirements, and they translate those business requirements into code. 
They feel good, right? I got my coat out. And then there's this wall, right? And they toss that stuff over the wall to operations. And it was operations job to be able to take this and they focused in on being able to deploy it, be able to make sure it's up and running, you know, uptime, break fix. Uh, and they would focus in on the traditional operation responsibilities of reliability, compliance, and financial management. And of course, this wall, this clear wall is the, the problem, right? In fact, it's not a wall, it's a chasm of despair, okay? This is the source of lots of problems. So the next 20 years, I think, is pretty clear, right? The next 20 years really is about the merger of devs and operations into DevOps. And what we believe here is that merging these two things uh, allows better um, business results, okay? And so the idea here is that we'll have these nice tight loops of integrated uh, uh, teams working on gaining insights, gaining insights into what the customer needs, gaining insights into how things are running and supporting operations and then taking those learnings and translating them into your backlog where you then go develop and build quickly, small batches. You want to test and stabilize those things and you want to deploy and maintain them, okay? And the point is that you have these loops, right? Or continuous loops. And in fact, uh, you know, Sam, hopefully you're going to talk about it today, has this wonderful, Sam Guggenheimer, the marvelous Sam Guggenheimer, uh, has a fantastic concept. Uh, he talks about how DevOps is really all about maximizing the rate of validated learning. Okay, so just remember that phrase. It's awesome and the model is, is very strong. But that's what we're trying to do here, is to have nice small loops working together to drive business results. Now, I think it's always good, and back to that kind of theoretical foundation, it's always great to ask the five whys. Why, why, why? Why are we doing this stuff? And the answer is that digital transformation requires alignment, right? You can't achieve great results unless you all know what you're trying to achieve and you're pulling in the same direction, right? So in, if, in, in order to deliver business innovation, you have to have your people, processes, and platforms. A lot of people ignore the platforms part, and that's wrong. You gotta include the platforms. Why? Because technology can make DevOps easy, or it can make DevOps hard. So if you ignore, ignore the platform part, you're setting yourself up for failure, okay? So you need to align these things. And so how do you align them? And the answer is you align them through shared tools, shared insights, shared uh, uh, culture, and shared ownership, okay? So, second why. Why are we doing that? And you've all heard of Moore's Law, yes? Hopefully, okay. There's a second Moore's Law in computing, right? The other Moore's Law, and this is Jeffrey Moore. And Jeffrey Moore talked about how every company participates in two types of activities. They participate in core activities. Now these are activities that differentiate your competitor, you from your competitors. They deliver unique value add and allow you to charge a premium. Okay, good stuff, right? Context activities is everything else. Okay, so every business participates in the things that differentiate them and the things that don't. Now let me be clear, let me give you an example. Microsoft, our business is software. So we scour the world trying to find the world's best software talent. We invest in those people and we, spend all, uh, we want every ounce of energy focused in on delivering the best software. Now in order to do that, we also have to do a number of things that don't differentiate us, right? We have to have cafeterias, we have to have shuttles, we have to have receptionists, okay? We have no technical fellows of the cafeterias no distinguished engineers of the shuttles, no vice presidents of the receptionist, right? Those are important things. We value those things, but the things we just want to write a check for, have great service, and then focus all of our executives and all our great talent on the things that differentiate us. Because look, if I had great cafeterias, I'm not going to sell more than AWS or Google or anything, right? I want to focus in on the things that differentiate me. So that's this core versus context. But there's another axis here, and that's where it gets interesting. And that other axis is enabling versus mission critical, 
Okay? And the point he makes is that you want to be focusing in on core mission critical stuff. Now, what's the definition of mission critical? Definition of mission critical is if you screw up, it's bad. It's really, really bad, right? You can't screw up, okay? Now, the challenge here is that when you have one of these great things and you're differentiating against your competitors, the market will respond. And it'll take time, but the market will respond. And that eventually what happens is that it no longer, you're no longer able to charge a premium for this thing, but it remains mission critical. Now, this is the key concept. It is mission critical, but you're no longer able to charge a premium. You're no longer able to differentiate from your competitors. Okay? So this is where you have risk. Okay? Real risk to the business. So the strategy is you want to focus here, and you want to de-risk this space. Now, how do you de-risk this space? The challenge is that because it's mission critical, right? Remember the definition of mission critical? Screw up, you're in big trouble. So you can't screw up. So because you can't screw up, people continue to invest in this area, and sometimes they, in fact, increase their investments. Because often the way you get here is by building technical debt, right? And so then it, you're like, oh, I got all this debt. You want to address that technical debt at a time you cannot charge a premium for it. Okay? So the strategy, now Jeffrey Moore is very clear about this. He says, this area, people who mismanage this area, this is the killing field of once great companies. And he gives example after example after example of companies who found themselves in this quadrant, misspent their resources, and died. Okay? This is a company killer. So how do you deal with this space? And the answer is this. You have to reduce risk by reducing complexity. How do you reduce complexity? And the answer is you standardize. Instead of having seven ways to do things, you have one way to do things. You componentize. You componentize so that each one of the components you can either then automate or you can offload to somebody else. And when you can do these things, what you can do is you reduce the complexity, therefore you reduce the risk, and therefore, you can still be mission critical, make sure you're not screwing up, and move resources from it to somewhere else. Okay? So, great concept. Who cares? Well, the answer is, this is the foundation of the digital transformation, right? So, here's the question. How many of you are able to go to your board and say, hey, I got a great idea, digital transformation, double my, double my uh, budget, and we're going to go do that, right? I see no hands, right? That's not a successful strategy. So what you have to do is if you're going to be successful with digital transformation, you have to create bandwidth in order to go do that. And the question is, how do you create bandwidth? Well, I assert that Jeffrey Moore's framework is the, is the framework for understanding how you can generate bandwidth to go pursue digital transformation and why digital transformation is so important. So step number one, most important thing, you want to focus all your energy on building the things that differentiate you, right? So here's the basic model. Buy or build? Simple question. You want to build the things that differentiate you. You want to buy the things that don't. Simple as that. Build, buy. Build the things that differentiate you. What differentiates you? Differentiated applications, right? I love DevOps, but I got to tell you, I don't think DevOps is quite got the right focus. In my mind, uh, DevOps is critical, but it's really about digital transformation. And I'll know that, and by the way, when you pull on the thread of digital transformation, you get DevOps. But there's more when you pull on the thread of digital transformation. In particular, I'll be happy when I go to a DevOps conference and I see some talks about how to listen to customers well. How to know when the customer is telling you the truth and when they're not telling you the truth, or they're not telling you a true need versus a real need. How to respond to customers, how to set up surveys, et cetera. So that's what it's all about, right? You want to listen to customers, you want to gain insight from that, and then you want to act upon it. And when you act upon it, you act upon it using DevOps. Okay? So you want to focus in on listening to customers and building differentiated applications. Next, you want to buy everything else. <clears throat> You want to buy what does not differentiate you. And so these are things like commodity workloads and infrastructure, right? 
Anybody here believe that you can sell more airplane seats or sell more sneakers by managing DNS better than your competitors or IP or provisioning a server? Like, oh man, I can provision a server better than they can. I'm gonna put more people in an airplane seat? Like, no, no. That stuff does not differentiate you from your competitors. Having an application that says, hey, I see you're logging in, uh, you know, you're, you're flying with us in a couple days, would you like to order a special meal? Would you like to have your bags delivered, et cetera? That's differentiated value. That all just happened to me on this trip, so I know about that. <clears throat> and third, as part of this digital transformation strategy, is you wanna solve that dilemma that it's mission critical, I can't screw up, but I can't charge differentiated value by using the cloud. The cloud allows you to just buy the things that don't differentiate you and focus in on stuff that does. Building the DevOps muscle, building uh, great differentiated applications, right? So you reduce the risk by reducing complexity. You standardize on one set of tools. You use those tools, become expert in those tools. You leverage automations and you outsource. Hey, I'm gonna let the cloud manage this for me. I'm not gonna do that myself. Now, how do you do that, right? How do you generate this bandwidth so you can perform, do this work? So the old IT, you had a bunch of physical servers, this ran on premises, okay, you have virtualized it. In reality, virtualization was kind of about consolidation, gave a little bit of agility to some people, other people not so much. Um, and this is now translating to hybrid cloud. Now in the past we used to say the cloud, and by the cloud we meant public cloud. Uh, we no longer believe that. We believe that, and we, when we talked about the hybrid cloud, we would talk about it as a stepping stone to an all public cloud. We no longer believe that. And listening to customers and, and, and drilling in on this, we believe that the hybrid cloud is the steady state model. Uh, and obviously this is the case because our competitors are, are going through uh, all sorts of uh, ab absurd uh, things to try and copy and hybrid cloud wash their stuff, right? When it's in fact not hybrid cloud at all. Uh, so this is, this is the thing that customers really want is this hybrid cloud. Now, what is a hybrid cloud? And the answer is it's the cloud model, but the cloud model, some of it's running in the public cloud, and some of it's running on-premises using private clouds, okay? So, how do we do this? Step number one, Gren, how do you create bandwidth? Step number one, for commodity workloads, right, the things that don't differentiate you, does anybody think running your own exchange servers helps you sell more sneakers? If so, love to talk to you about that, understand that, because I don't believe that's true. So for those commodity workloads, things like Dynamics, Exchange, uh, VSTS, just write a check and use those as software as a service, okay? Number two, for the on-premises stuff, you know, just leave it alone. Just lift and shift it, put it in a, in a virtualization environment, maybe upgrade the OS. Uh, but here, then you want to focus in on taking workloads and just lift and shifting them and running in the public cloud, just by doing that, guess what? You create bandwidth. Because in the public cloud, so many things are given for you. You'll see, you know, you'll be able to just say, hey, um, this, this, you have these VMs in the, in the cloud, they're out of date. Would you like to update them? Would you like to patch them? Would you like to secure them? And these are all very easy native cloud functions that in the past you had to go invest in, you know, I've got to buy a management product. Those management products cost a million plus dollars. So you got to do a request for you know, a, a, an evaluation and test it out. And then you have to have an organization and somebody's got to run it and you got to care and feed it, right? You ever heard the joke about the admin, right? The admin has a problem, so he writes a Perl script, then he has two problems, well, right? So often these management products were like that. You had a problem, so you bought a management product and then you had two problems, right? Because you got to maintain, how many people are running all of your managing products on the latest version of those products, right? No, no, because guess what? You know, maintaining the managing products themselves is a task and it's hard, right? I used to go to the uh, Microsoft Management Summit and my joke was that, you know, about a third of those talks were all about the care and feeding of the beast, right? Getting SMS up and running or SCCM up and running, right? You know, approach it gently, you know, speak softly, no sudden movements. Uh, it's just insane how much energy went into the care and maintenance of your managing products. By lifting and shifting your workloads to the cloud, 
You just say, enable something, you get that management for free, it's always up to date, et cetera. So you get a lot of great bandwidth freed up just by lifting and shifting. Now, with some of that bandwidth, what you're gonna do is you're gonna lift and modernize, right? Hey, I'm gonna take that stuff, maybe put it in a container, maybe leverage some cloud services, and automate things, right? Automation is critical. Even for the things you're not gonna say, oh, I'm gonna modernize, et cetera. If you can automate it, you can free up bandwidth so that you can do other things, okay? So you lift and shift or you lift and modernize, and these things create bandwidth so that then you can focus in on cloud-born digital transformation, right? Now, you can run that in Azure PaaS, or you can run that on Azure Stack. Either one runs fine. The net, what we're trying to achieve here is a shift in focus for your IT spend, right? Right now, lots of studies for a long time that showed about you know, 80 plus percent of the IT budget is, and, and focus is spent just keeping the lights on. And what we wanna do, and that's all context stuff. Again, stuff you cannot differentiate, things you can't compete with. 80% of your budget on stuff you can't compete with, that's not such a good thing. Well, imagine you could turn that to 80% of your budget where you can compete. Okay, now imagine that you don't do that, but your competitors do, right? That's gonna be a bad situation, right? So you wanna be the one doing this before your competitors do. And the point, oh, by the way, and the point is that that's all great, but it's really possible. We've been talking about this for a long time, but it really is possible leveraging DevOps, Azure, and Azure Stack, okay? So again, what you do, the way you, you make that shift is you buy infrastructure in SaaS, and you automate. That creates bandwidth. With that bandwidth, you invest in innovation. And that's how you make this transformation. So Azure, you all know about Azure. The heart of it is fantastic cloud modern development platform, right? Great cloud services, great features, great paths. Uh, these things are run for you. Right? You don't have to run them. These things are secured for you. You don't have to secure them. Okay? And leveraging them allows you to focus in on the stuff that differentiates you, not just commodity stuff. Of course, it has modern, and op modern development operation tools and resources. Okay? Uh, Microsoft has a wide range of tools that we are tightly um, uh, aligning and loosely coupling. So what does that mean? That means when you use all the Microsoft stuff, you'll see it goes step to step to step, nice and smoothly. However, it's loosely coupled. At any point in time, you can say, hey, I don't like that Microsoft tool. It's not best in breed. I'd rather use this other tool. And that will work just fine in Microsoft's cloud. And Microsoft Azure provides planetary scale infrastructure. And I really do mean that, planetary scale. These things are amazing. And I've got a slide that shows that. But the benefit of Azure infrastructure being available throughout the planet means low latency to your customers everywhere, right? In the past, right, we'd say, okay, well, hey, I wanna transact some business, and uh, you transact position in a particular geography, and if you ran your own data centers, people near you would have great response, but people far away from you didn't have great response and you were less competitive. Now with Azure, you can say, hey, this is an interesting marketplace. I want to run my application there and deliver low latency to those people um, you know, just with the click of a button. Now, as I mentioned to you, we believe that Azure, um, that the hybrid cloud is a steady state. So what does that mean? As we talked to customers, we found that there were some durable, and when we first started Azure Stack, honestly, we had a whole bunch of, well, you know, it can do this, and it can do this, and it can do this, and it can do this. And when we pulled on those threads, we said, yeah, you know, but this scenario, in reality, that's a stepping stone scenario. You know, in, in, in time, the public cloud will be able to do that just as well and perhaps better. And so as we really drilled down, what we found was that there were some steady state enduring scenarios, okay? And they are these three. First is edge and disconnected solutions, okay? So the easiest way to get this in focus is submarines, 
right? You got a submarine, guess what? They want to have modern cloud, modern applications, cloud design center, but they are not connected. They're, they're not going to run those applications in a public cloud. They need to run on the submarine. Now, it turns out that that helps everybody get things in focus. It turns out that the marketplace for selling software to submarines is not that large. Uh, However, the disconnected edge scenarios is quite large. Uh, we've talked to some cruise lines, and cruise lines are occasionally connected. When they come into port, they're connected. When they're not, when they're at sea, they are not connected. And it turns out that a modern uh, cruise line has like three data centers in them. Did you know that? They really do. They got like three data centers, right? And it's running stuff like the navigation systems. It's running the, the gaming systems and the point of sale systems. It is quite a, an automated scenario, right? And they'd like to be able to run those using modern cloud applications. Other scenarios are uh, things where you have um, lots of data, like a control loop in a factory, okay? Factory, what you do is you collect a ton of information from all your sensors, you process that, and then you control the robots, right? Now, you don't want the public internet in that control loop, right, between this collection and the controlling of the robots. Because if something goes wrong with the public internet, you know, a DDoS attack or somebody cuts a cable or there's some power outage somewhere, uh, you lose control of your robots. Now, that's a bad thing. If you're not clear on this, please watch the Terminator movie. It will explain <laughs> why you always want to be in control of your robots, okay? So, so having edge scenarios there where you're doing the process in a tight loop is very important. So that is a stable case. The other is uh, regulations. Look, regulations are a real thing. Uh, they're a legitimate thing. And there are various people who cannot run certain types of applications in any place but that country. So we're working with one financial country, company who has this great application that they provide to all their associates throughout the world. And it's, a, it's an Azure application. And then there are particular company, countries where they're not able to to access the public cloud, they're taking exactly the same application and running it on Azure Stack in that country. Okay, So they're able to innovate and respond to regulations. And the third is cloud application model on premises. That a lot of people want to modernize their applications, say they've got a legacy system, uh, a mainframe or a big Oracle system that they want to apply the strangler pattern to put a new front end to it, talk to that front end, increase the size of that over time, and then strangle the back end over time. So you want to have that thing close to your data and close to your control, you know, close to the legacy system, and then at some point you can partition which parts do I want to run on premises and which parts don't I. Anyway, these are the three enduring use cases for the hybrid cloud. Azure Stack, Azure Stack is Azure services available on premises. It provides consistent development and operations, and it provides this integrated delivery experience. So what's that all mean? Here's what we're trying to achieve, right? A common stack between Azure Stack and Azure, right? And as you walk down this, right now, now, now let's put our architect's hat on, right? As architects, we know that there are two ways to be, deliver consistency, right? First way to deliver consistency is compatibility. Definition of compatible, different, okay? So the other way you deliver consistency is the same, okay? It's the same code. As much as possible, I deliver Azure consistency by being the same. I deliver the same code. So the PowerShell, the portal, the DevOps tools, those are all the same. It's exact same code for Azure and Azure Stack. The Azure Resource Manager, the Azure IaaS, the Azure PaaS, that's all the same code. Now in Azure Stack, I have a subset of some of the PaaS services, but the ones I have, it's the same code, okay? Then there's cloud infrastructure, and in cloud infrastructure can't be the same because of the design's point for Azure Stack. They get fantastic efficiencies because they have such a large design center. Here I have compatible um, infrastructure. Azure has a sealed set of hosts that they design the hardware, and they seal that host, and everything runs on top of that. Here, I worked with uh, a, a set of hardware manufacturers. We co-designed these systems, and these are also sealed systems. I mentioned to you Azure services everywhere. Here is the point, planetary scale infrastructure. Azure has 42 regions throughout the globe. 
Azure Stack now takes those services and APIs and tooling and is going to make them available through hundreds of service providers and through thousands of enterprises. Okay? And what this does is it builds a fantastic Azure ecosystem. Okay? And what that means is that if you're developing a solution, you now get a maximal addressable market. You build that thing, you can sell it everywhere. Lots of different instances. Some people want to run it in the public cloud, but they needed to have great latency in Africa. Got a great solution for you. Uh, hey, they want to be able to do this, uh, but they can't let the data go out of this country. Great, you can run it on Azure Stack. So your solutions can run the maximal number of places. Number two, as customers, you get the maximal number of solutions, right, for, this, for the inverse reasons. And then as employees, as individuals and employers, we all benefit, right? Because a lot of people have stubbed their toes on these bespoke public or private clouds, their own private cloud, oh, I got my own thing, and then they try and hire. And one, nobody has the you know, uh, Acme private cloud expertise on their, on their resume, so you can't hire those people. And then two, if you've developed that expertise for having worked for Acme Company for the last five years, and you put that on your resume, oh, I'm an expert in Acme Cloud infrastructure, nobody's going to hire you, right? It means nothing. You, do, you don't help them. But when you're able to put Azure, uh, your research, Azure skill and tooling on your resume, guess what? You're going to knock on 10 doors and a lot of them are going to open. As an employer, you're able to say, hey, I'd like to have somebody who knows Azure skills. And you're going to be able to hire from a, people, a group of people that can come on board and be productive on day one versus having to figure out how to get things working. Now, the point here is that it's so important, I made it twice, is that, uh, is that for this to work, the, the, it requires, for the ecosystem to work properly, it requires version consistency, okay? Version consistency. What that means is we can't have uh, uh, Azure Stack be multiple versions down level from Azure. If so, then when you write an application, it'll work in some places, but not the other. No, 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 so we have to keep version consistent. Now, what that means is that Azure Stack has to control the version and has to keep up to date, okay? So, for instance, in patching and updating, as a customer, you will have the choice of when to update, but not if. Okay, so patches come, you must be up to date, uh, and you'll uh, be able to defer that for up to three months, but then you'll have to be up to date. And why? It's to make sure that the ecosystem is consistent. So the real key point here is Azure Stack is new, and uh, you don't want to project your past into it. Okay, and this is what I see a lot happening. So, so an example, I originally learned Fortran. Okay, and then C came out, and I said, oh, that's great, and so I started writing C programs, but in fact, they were Fortran programs using the C compiler, right? And then it took me some number of months before I started writing C programs. And then at some point, the C++ compiler came out, and guess what? I wrote C programs using the C++ compiler for the first six months. It always takes a while for you to, like, uh, you know, you project your past into the new set of tooling, and what I'm saying is, hey, you want to not do that here. You want to stop, understand what it is, and then accept it or reject it based upon what it is, not what you hope it to be. So this is made worse by this cloud washing, okay? So this Matt here tweeted out. He says, hey, I'm at the Oracle campus for a media event. I guess you could say I'm on premises, to which Frank Shaw replied, actually, the way Oracle defines it, you're in the cloud, okay? <laughs> So, right, the cloud and the hybrid cloud are very hot, and people, what people are doing is they're just taking the stuff that they have to sell on the, on the shelf, and they try and sell it to you. And you come back and you say, I'm not buying that. My directors don't want to buy anything that's not related to the cloud. And you're like, it's cloud related. Here, let me put a sticker on it. Now it's hybrid cloud. And literally, that's what you're seeing with some of these, uh, these things. So that, that doesn't help. Let me be clear. Azure Stack is not putting a sticker on top of some old stuff. It is a hybrid cloud. And so when we clear about what it is and what it isn't, you might just want the old stuff with the cloud name on it, but that's not what this is. So what is Azure Stack? Azure Stack is the first product in a new category, this hybrid cloud platform. 
it is not a virtualization replacement, right? We have virtualization. If you just want to run VMs, we got System Center, we got Windows Server. You can take that, put it on any hardware you want, put any management software on there, control it all, manage the details, what's the queue length of the NIC and blah, blah, blah. You can do all that stuff. I don't think that's going to put more people in your airplanes. I don't think it's going to sell more, sne more sneakers. But you can do that. That's infinite control. That's not what this is. This is the public, this is a hybrid cloud platform. So concretely, it is an integrated system that delivers self-service, IaaS, PaaS, and cloud solutions. And it's not a do-it-yourself infrastructure play. Okay, it's an integrated system. And it is regularly updated for Azure consistency. It's not a static system that you can deploy and forget. It has to be kept up to date. Now, this integrated delivery experience, here's what's going on. You'll be able to buy an integrated experience from any of these vendors, right? Dell, HP, Lenovo. Uh, I believe soon you'll be able to order it from Cisco and Huawei. Uh, and these things, the whole point is that it comes in, rolls in, and it's, you know, they, they will, you buy it as an integrated system. The, the, uh, whoever you buy it from will roll it in and they provide installation services. A day or two after they're done, after it arrives at the dock, it's up and running and you're delivering these IaaS, PaaS, and uh, solutions to your customers, right? So very quick time to deployment. It is an extension of the Azure model, right? The billing model, right? So you pay for the hardware. You don't pay for the software until you use it, okay? You pay on use. So it's exactly like Azure. You're not using Azure, you don't pay for it. You use a little bit of Azure, you pay a little bit. You use a lot of Azure, you pay a lot. If you stop using some, you stop paying. Exactly the same model for the software in Azure Stack. And then there's this you know, integrated support. You pick who you want to call, your hardware vendor or Microsoft. We will take care of you 100%. We'll work with the other people behind the scenes to make sure it's, it, the ticket is closed. Now, with these integrated systems, here's the model. You pick a vendor and you pick a capacity. Four nodes, eight nodes, 12 nodes. That's the deal. You don't go saying, hey, I found, I read some Electronic Engineering Times and there's this great new NIC and I want to use that NIC. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's not the deal. It's an integrated system. You pick a vendor and you pick a capacity. That's the model. Again, Dell, HP, Lenovo, here are the systems. And why are we doing this, right? And really there are two answers. Answer number one is that integrated systems Again, allow, create bandwidth that allow you to focus in on differentiation, right? We just think it's the wrong thing for you to, okay, here's the thing. How many people have tried to set up a private cloud? Okay. How many of you were successful within one quarter? <laughs> Two quarters? Ever? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously, these things, but you've heard the phrase and it's true, most private clouds fail. Most private clouds fail, even the one because guess what? It's incredibly hard, and you're spending all this time and all this energy, right? OpenStack, right? The OpenStack is not going very well. Uh, the, a very small subset of the people who try and uh, get off the ground with OpenStack succeed. When they do succeed, you ask them the question: How many people do you have on your OpenStack engineering team? And you will hear very large numbers, right? 40, 80, over 100. And at some point, you know, the Turks have this great phrase. They say, when you're on the wrong road turn around no matter how much progress you thought you made, okay? And so these people at some point, they're like, they're just trying to like, you know, sell airplanes or sell sneakers, and they got 100 engineers standing up in OpenStack private cloud. Like, what sense does that make? How does that help you sell more sneakers? Anyway, so a lot of people are just, but most of them are failing, because this, this is really hard stuff. So what we do is it comes in and it just works. Guess what? That's 100 engineers you don't have messing around. That's 100 engineers that you can focus in on DevOps to build differentiated applications. That's the point. Second is we, don't, we believe you shouldn't have to do DevOps to create the platform in order to do DevOps on, okay? 
Okay, so this integrated life cycle, again, you're going to see how Azure Stack creates bandwidth for you. Why? Because I'm taking responsibility for the entire life cycle, right? It's not just the fact that you purchase this thing. It's a simple purchase decision for a 12 systems. Somebody comes in, they get it deployed with you, and uh, you're up and running within a couple days using it, right? That's this, right? I did the hardware integration, the architecting with the vendors. It's going to be deployed. We have validation. Then we're going to do the monitoring and diagnostics. We're, we've got all the um, workflows for the FRUs, field replacement units, for the patching and the updating, uh, the business continuity, and the security. Azure Stack has fantastic security. Love to talk to you about it. It's just crazy good. We do all this for you. So this is all stuff you don't have to do so you can focus in on applications. So to recap, that's sort of the story, right? There we are, right? Azure Stack is the first hybrid cloud platform. It's not virtualization. It's an integrated system that you get and it comes up and it runs and gives you uh, self-service, IaaS, PaaS, and solutions. The solutions are the things you go to the Azure Stack, or sorry, the Azure Gallery, and you say, oh, I'd like to have a, um, uh, an, electro a, an e commerce platform. And there are templates in the Azure Gallery that say, yep, yeah, here's 15 of them, which one would you like? And you pick it, and it auto deploys it, and then you're using that e commerce platform. Same thing will happen with Azure Stack. You'll be able to syndicate your local gallery with the Azure Stack Gallery. Pick which ones you want to offer to your customers and replicate them down, and then they're offered to your customers. So it's not about DIY infrastructure. And it remains consistent with Azure. Why? And again, it's the digital transformation strategy. You want to focus in on building the things that differentiate you, and that is applications. I want you to spend your time figuring out how to listen to customers, how to know when they're telling you the truth, and figure out how to quickly respond to those needs, deploy that, monitor, listen again, iterate, and kick the competitor's butt, okay? Managing DNS, managing servers doesn't, doesn't get you that. So you don't just want to buy that stuff. And then you want to solve this mission critical context stuff, this thing, it's absolutely important. Look, we all have systems that are mission critical, but they're not helping us move the business forward. So what you need to do is you need to figure out how to keep them up and running, executing on their mission at the lowest possible cost. And the way you do that is by leveraging the cloud. Lift and shift those things, take advantage of the native cloud capabilities to be able to reduce things. You might want to modernize some of those, create some more bandwidth, but this allows you to free things up to go focus in on innovation. So DevOps, Hopefully now this all makes sense. DevOps is about aligning people and processes. Cloud platforms in general, they're all great. A bunch of the stuff I mentioned today will work across any cloud platform. That's great. Azure is one of those great cloud platforms. Azure Stack, however, allows you to take that and extend it to a wider group of customers and a wider range of scenarios. And this is why I feel confident in saying this is the best bet for your career and for your people, right? That you can go invest in these things and you're buying into a great ecosystem that's going to deliver great choice. And then again, the punchline, DevOps, Azure and Azure Stack, align and accelerate the people, processes, and platforms uh, to deliver tr digital transformation. So that's it. I think we have a time for a couple questions or comments. Hey, did this did any of this make any sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah? No if you have any questions, in which case I will hand you a mic. Questions, anyone? No one? Who here is actually running Azure Stack or has used the Azure Stack preview? Stick your hand up. How have you found it so far? <laughs> I, I, I can do you a good deal on Colo. We're using it because we've been reviewing it at Chef 
and uh, Stuart Preston has been working on getting some of the um, extensions onto it. I haven't had any. Um, I haven't had any access to it myself, but I know that the team are putting it together, and we've been getting it to the the ARM templates extensions work with it. That's why we're using it at the moment. Any questions about digital transform transformation or anything else? All right. No? Sounds great. Well, okay. thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jeffrey.